Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, today it's a pleasure to have Joaquin. He's going to tell us about uh, random matrix theory for black holes and supergravity. Thank you very much for the inv invitation to speak at, at the seminar. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about random matrix for black hole supergravity, which is some work in progress with Newton. Uh, hopefully, will come out soon. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, let, let me begin before I start with the actual material with some comments about why I think this is an interesting question. So it's clear that, in particular, wormholes became a very important um, ingredient in understanding quantum aspects of black holes. Um, in particular, perhaps the uh, realization by Sachin and Stanford that, that, well, if one tried to address the question of how to see from, from gravity the microscopic nature of the black hole microstates, they found certain wormholes that, well, they don't do this, but at least they, they uncover in some regime <clears throat> the uh, level repartition between the eigenvalues characteristic of a random matrix model. And they constructed wormholes that, that are universal. You can, you can make them for any black hole you are given. <clears throat> um, moreover, after that, they also came up with a toy model of this, which is a two-dimensional pure jacket Tidewan gravity. And, and this is a simple theory of gravity that captures these features exactly, and it's exactly dual to a random matrix model with a particular uh, matrix potential and particular ensemble. Um, so one motivation for, for doing this, what I, what I would describe, would be a generalization for theories with supersymmetry. Um, let me clarify, I'm not going to analyze only VPS states, but I will try to understand the random matrix uh, behavior of, of the whole spectrum. Um, so we will try to extend this to, in particular, I will focus on these toy models of pure JT gravity with, with a higher amount of supersymmetry. Um, so that will be the goal of the talk. And again, motivation for considering this particular symmetry is that all the models I know of, particularly from string theory, that are dual to black holes, we, we know have this, this symmetry. Doesn't have to be a feature of all possible models, but at least the ones I, I know about. So then it's reasonable to, to try to understand the role wormholes plays in this series. OK, so that's the. Uh, Motivation. So let me begin with with a with a review. <clears throat> so in the first part of the talk, I will discuss random discuss random matrix theory without uh, talking about gravity, and that will be for the second part of the talk. So if we have <clears throat> random matrix theory without supersymmetry, uh, these are the known Dyson ensembles that depend on whether you have time reversal or not. You could also have unitary symmetries, but those are straightforward because you just go to a sector of a fixed representation of that unitary symmetry. And then within that sector, the, the ensemble reduces to, to the Dyson one. Um, perhaps the first case where, where it, this becomes non-trivial is for when you have quantum mechanics with one supercharge. And this case was analyzed by uh, Stanford and Witten, 2019, shortly after the SSS <coughs> results. Um, so as I said, this is a theory with a supercharged Q, and the Hamiltonian is given by the supercharged square. Um, we also assume, at least we'll consider only theories that have a minus one to the F. And what this means is that the Hilbert space can be separated in, in two by two blocks that are bosonic and fermionic. And, and this is an operator that assigns a value one or minus one uh, for each block. Uh, so this supercharge is, is self-adjoint and is all odd under this minus one to the F. And that means, let me write it here, that it will take this form. Where a little Q now is an operator that maps um, the bosonic sector of the Hilbert space to the fermionic one. Um, Q dagger does the, the inverse. Um, so under unitary, usually when constructing the random matrix ensembles, one focuses on what, what are the symmetries you wanted to have. In particular, in the Dyson ensembles, one uses 
probability distribution over the matrices that are invariant under uh, unitary changes of basis. Uh, in this case, we want changes of basis or unitary transformations that are that preserve the structure of the Hilbert space being separated into bosonic and fermion. Um, under this symmetry, Q transforms in the following way. Let me write it this way. Where UL is a unitary acting on the fermionic part of the Hilbert space and UB is acting on the bosonic part of the Hilbert space. So if one wants to construct a random matrix ensemble, the, the random matrix should be the lowercase Q, which is a bifundamental of these two unitary groups. Uh, Using this symmetry, one can put this Q in a canonical form. Um, so, but first of all, let me say that the number of states in the bosonic and the fermionic, oh, yes, we'll in the bosonic and the fermionic part of the Hilbert space don't need to be the same. So the matrix little Q can be rectangular. And then a canonical way to present this matrix is in terms of, I will call it eigenvalues, maybe they should be called singular values. Would be more appropriate. Uh, lambda one to, to lambda L, and L is the so let me see. LF is the dimension of the fermionic part of the Hilbert space. And then we have a matrix of all zeros where say this length will be LF, which I'm choosing, I'm choosing to be smaller than. The bosonic size, this, this of course is just, a, you can consider the, the opposite case as well. And this is new, which is the absolute value of LF minus OB. And let me write it just to avoid confusion. And all this set of this block of zeros in the in the matrix Q will correspond to the states, so the to the big states, the states that have um, exactly zero energy. When well, if we replace Q in the in the uppercase Q and put in the Hamiltonian, that's trivial. Uh, and then one can ask if if we want to average over over this matrix Q, then how does the average reduce to uh, to an integral over the eigenvalues. And the answer is that it takes this form. I'm, I'm not going to derive these things because I want to get to the gravity part. Let me just tell you the answer. Uh, OK, we're not going to assume any time reversal symmetry. This is for would correspond to theories that, that are unorientable in the bulk. In this case, alpha is equal to one plus two nu, and beta is equal to two. So here, alpha is a parameter that appears in the measure of the eigenvalue. Nu, I remind you, is the difference between the, the bosonic and fermionic dimensions, or, or the index also. And beta is the power of, of, of the difference of eigenvalues on the, the version of, this will be the version of the van der Monde determinant for this ensemble, um, and its value is two. Yes. And the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian is this Q squared, there will be this lambda squared. Okay. So this was a review of, of the previous story. So let me describe now n equals two quantum mechanics. Um, so in this case, we're going to assume the presence of a complex supercharged Q. <clears throat> now the Hamiltonian will be. And the commentator of Q and Q dagger. And something that will be important is that this Q is not arbitrary, but it's constrained, it's constrained such that the square is squared to zero. And, and this is just what it means to have n equals to n equals to algebra in quantum mechanics. Um, we will also assume the presence of a U1R symmetry generated by, by operator I call J. Um, and we will assume it satisfies the following properties. So the, the spectrum of J will be integers plus delta. 
So these integers that, that are the eigenvalues of J will be the charges, the R charges of the states. And we allow delta, which is a real number between zero and one half, that, um, well, maybe it will become clear later what, what the origin is. But for, for example, in SYK or, or, or a theory of with complex fermions, if you have an even number of complex fermions, this parameter is zero. But if you have an odd number, that parameter is one half, then you are forced to study this generalization. <clears throat> Uh, I don't know of any theory that realizes the uh, intermediate values of delta, but then it's natural to just keep it as a free parameter. Okay. Another parameter of the theory is the, the charge of the, the R charge of the, of the supercharge. And there is a similar formula for Q dagger with a minus sign. And the parameter is Q hat, and <clears throat> this is in principle an arbitrary odd integer. Uh, for simplicity in this talk, we will take it to be one. Why does it have to be odd? Um, well, yeah, sorry, I didn't say it yet, but the, so the spectrum of the charges are integers, and the way I define it, bosonic states have even charge, and fermionic states have odd, odd charge, uh, so you want the supercharge to be, a fermion, to be part of the fermionic uh, sector. That's, that's all. Uh, you can also change the sign, but then the is equivalent to shifting what you mean by Q and Q dagger. Uh, yeah. Finally, another, yeah, maybe I should have said it before, but the operator that distinguishes bosons and fermions is this operator. And uh, let me verify that this is classical. So classically, if you have a fermion and you have a minus one to the f that changes the sign, you can realize it by, by this U1 transformation. But this, this is a statement that I emphasize that it's classical because it can have anomalies depending on the value of delta, in particular when delta is equal to one half. OK. So as I said, the Hilbert space can be separated into sectors of fixed charge, R charge, that I, I will call Q, and the range is over whatever the spectrum is, with, with the value of purple delta. Uh, and similarly, I can expand the supercharge in blocks that are on each signal of the Hilbert space. So we we'll write it first. <laughs> so the QPAs are operators that map states of charge K to charge K plus one. Uh, so you can imagine the matrix Q as a matrix of zeros in, in blocks of fixed charge. And then above the diagonal, you have these blocks QK that map you certain charge to charge plus one. And I'm, I'm, I'm using Q hat equals one, so the charge of the supercharge is one. Otherwise, here I will have Q plus uh, K plus Q hat. OK. <clears throat> so there are two types of multiplex. In this theory, we have BPS states that come in a single charge K, and then we have non BPS states that come in charge K and K plus one. Um, this allows to further decompose the Hilbert space into three parts. So we have and let me write it and then tell you what it is. So the fixed charge Hilbert space can be separated into the H naught. These are the VPS states of a given charge. Then you have H plus, which are states that participate in K minus one K multiplex. And then you have uh, K minus, which are states that participate in K, K plus one multiplex. <laughs> and one of the difficult, oh, I think I said it. Right. I mean, it's the annotation. Uh, so then one complication here compared to the case with n equals one supersymmetry is that if you are giving the Hilbert space, the states at the, at the given R charge, you in principle don't know whether you want to assign them to, to one multiple or the other. Um, so that is one of the, the first reasons why, why this case is, why it's not obvious how to generalize this case to the discussion of n equals one to n equals two. Um, so let me 
say a couple of more statements. So something straightforward, this, if, if we call LK the uh, dimension of the Hilbert space of charge K, then something obvious that we know is that the, the number of the dimension of each six subsector has to adapt to the total dimension of, sorry, the dimension of H naught, H minus, and H plus have to adapt to the dimension of HK. Um, in particular, we also know that this is equal to one plus. So what this means is that the, we know that you have, we have the same number of states um, in, let me see. The number of states that are part of HK minus are the same as the number of states in HK minus one plus um, because they are part of the same multiple. So this, these two numbers are the same. Uh, <clears throat> so what I wanted to, to illustrate with this formula is that uh, once we know what the number of BPS, BPS states are for a given R charge, we can use this, this formula to derive a recursion relation that would determine uh, all the, the, the numbers, these dimensions, LK plus and LK minus. So we don't know which states they are, but we can at least know what the dimension is of these super multiplets, at least given the number of BPS states. So the way I want to think about this is that once you are given a number of BPS states, then, then this determines a component of, of a family of solutions of U squared equals zero. And this is something that in principle you could generalize. So <clears throat> what I mean is that one can consider ensembles where this number fluctuates, but we will see later that in gravity this is not necessary. We will, we will take the number of VPS states to be fixed. Um, so on a, com <clears throat> on a given component of solutions of Q squared equals zero, what we want to average is overall uh, random values of, of this supercharged QK subject to the constraint that Q squared is zero, which as you can see, calculus. Let me write it first. That's it. Yeah, so this the function is, is just <clears throat> the statement that Q squared equals to zero after replacing Q by, by the sum of the QKs. Then what you will get is that you need to demand that all the QK plus one times QK have to vanish for all values of K. Um, so this, this is the matrix integral we're interested in to define this ensemble. Um, and at this point, you can see a complication compared to well, then it was one case, which is that, that this is coupling different supermultiplets. And in principle, you would like to know whether the supermultiplets are, um, well, the, the, the simplest situation would be that we can take all the supermultiplets and assume that uh, all the supercharges are statistically independent in each supermultiplet. That would be the most natural, but the simplest thing to do. But here we can see that they are coupled by the constraint, but also, as I said before, if you are given a state of a given R charge, you don't know in which supermultiple it participates. Um, and a nice feature that, again, I'm not gonna prove because I want to move on to, to gravity is that <clears throat> these two effects cancel. And if we write each supercharge QK in terms of its eigenvalues lambdas, say, then the eigenvalues for different values of, of K this QK are statistically independent. And it may, this measure reduces to a product over a measure for each of the eigenvalues separately. Um, and the measure corresponds to, uh, it has the same form as for n equals one, but now the parameters alpha and beta are in this form. So alpha is one, and the analog of, of null that appear there, the, the mismatch between the number of positive and fermionic states, is given by the number of BPS states at, at the given uh, the given charge, k or k plus one. This is for a multiple k k plus one. This is um, 
Well, more, moreover, we will assume just for for well to, to avoid unnatural situations that that only either of these two values is non-zero. So if both of them would be zero simultaneously, then you will have zero energy states with charge k and k plus one. There will be nothing preventing them to be lifted to a non-BPS multiplet. So for simplicity, for concreteness, we will assume that this is not the case. Um, well, you're trying to talk about a component of the space of solutions. Yes. Yeah, so we will focus on a component where 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 this doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is there any, any question so far? Okay, so the, the conclusion of this discussion was that when we have theories with extended supersymmetry, the random matrix ensemble appropriate to this situation is to have all the super multiplets be statistically independent. Um, moreover, something I didn't say is that in analogy with n equals one case, you can ask what are the, the BPS states inside the, the theory. Um, if you track down the derivation of this, you can see that the BPS states have random wave functions inside the the Hilbert space. <clears throat> Essentially, if you try to write each of these QKs, you will have blocks of, of zeros if, whenever the value of the archers has PPS states. Okay. So next, I want to talk about gravity. Um, so I describe a random metric ensemble, and we would like to, uh, to, to ask if there is a generalization of the SSS story to uh, describe the physics of, of this particular ensemble, and well, the answer is yes. Uh, and it's given by two-dimensional Jacquip title one gravity with, with n equals two super zero. Um, I'm not going to describe the theory in, in too much detail, but let me just say that the action has two terms. First, it has a topological term. Uh, this is the other characteristic. We have a two dimensional surfaces with boundaries. Uh, this will assign a, a given value depending on, on how many handles on, or boundaries we have. And in particular, it will correspond to, okay, maybe I didn't say it, but in, to connect with gravity, we would think of the, the large L limit in that notation of the matrix model and also the double scaling limit. And then the, <clears throat> that parameter that I call L there will correspond to, to S0. And then we have a bulk term that can be written, so it's not very easy to write down explicitly, but. L0, right? Sorry, what? Which L prep L0, you mean? Uh, well, I, I meant LK, but. Yeah, they all scale with the same factor with this node. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay, so the bulk action is can be written as a BF theory with a with the group SU1, comma one slash uh, one. So this is a super this is a super conformal group whose maximum bosonic subgroup is SL2R times U1. So this is the R symmetry. So <clears throat> and this SL2R will, will become a first order formulation of a 2D theory of gravity. So this part will reduce roughly to, to bosonic JT gravity, and, and this will be a, a U1 gauge field. And then the supergroup has four fermionic generators that will correspond to gravitinos and gelatinos that are part of the theory of the ball. Okay, and then we have boundary terms that are very important, but I'm not gonna discuss them. That are Simpler to discuss in the second order formulation. But <clears throat> uh, well, at least to, to connect with random matrix models <clears throat> or holography, will consider boundary conditions that that let's say, for example, if we have a single boundary. Ooh. So we would like boundary conditions that compute the trace over the Hilbert space of e to the minus beta h and times e to the i alpha j. 
So we have some temperature and some chemical potential for some fugacity for the UN archer. Um, so in order to do this, we will use uh, synthetic ADS2 boundary conditions that are the usual nearly ADS2 boundary conditions that uh, well, they break the, the conformal symmetry in the bulk and, and they require a specific set of boundary term to realize. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to describe this part too much because I assume that most people here probably at some point, well, even you know this thing out. Um, <clears throat> let me just say, well, and of course, because we are expecting to find a theory that is dual to an ensemble, we will call this with averages. So the first thing we want to do is to describe the, the black hole solution, which is a hyperbolic disk, um, to compute the partition function. Uh, from the partition function, we can extract the, the spectrum of the theory to leading order, at least in the it's not expansion. Before I present the answer, let me say what the structure of this partition function should be. So first, we have the number of BPS states. So just to use the same notation I used there. <laughs> um, here we have e to the i alpha k because that's the R charge of these states. Now we have a sum over the non BPS states. I'm going to write the motion announcement and I will tell you what it is for projective for right. Okay, for the non BPS states, they come in with, with two charges, so that's represented by these two exponentials. And then in principle, we can have any density of states as a function of the energy for a given supermultiple that I will label by the lowest charge k. And then they are weighted by the, by the temperature. <clears throat> so to do the path into energetic gravity, you integrate out over the dilaton or the n equals two version of it. You localize to hyperbolic surfaces. In the case of the disk, that's trivial, up to a boundary reparameterization mode that comes from this boundary term that I write down. Uh, that's the n equals two super Schwarzschild theory that you can solve using your favorite method to solve the Schwarzschild theory, um, obtain a prediction for, for these quantities. So in particular, well, let, let me write the answer too. Even though I won't write it to say where it comes from. We're talking about the disk. So first it has a factor of e to the S naught, because the only characteristic is one. Then we have a sum over saddles. And these are different saddles described by the profile of the U1 gauge fields in the bulk. Uh, we have a phase that depends on delta. So this can be th thought of as a theta angle type term in the bulk that will give rise to this shift in the R charges in the quantum mechanical description. And we have a one loop determinant. This <clears throat> this comes from the terms I'm writing down, they come from the fermions. Uh, and the, because the fermions are charged under the U1, they care about the, the U1 chemical potential and, and this integer n that labels different cells of the gauge fields. And then we have the classical action. I square over beta is the bosonic parameterization mode. And then we have the U1. Uh, this you can see is proportional to the chemical potential square, so it comes from the from the gauge field in the bulk. Um, so now there is some non-trivial steps to to take this formula and translate it into a prediction for the density of states of the matrix model. The first thing is that the number of BPS states is very simple. <laughs> there are only BPS states with zero arc charge. And that's related to the fact that I chose the R charge of the supercharge to be one. If I would have chosen another number, then I would have a spectrum of charges of BPS states. But okay, for this simplified uh, specific theory, then I only have BPS states of zero charge. Um, 
And then the leading order density of states for the non BPS sector is given by a formula that is very similar to the Boson uh, Schwarzschild density of states. Uh, so we have the sinh of 2 pi square root e, but now e is the thing that appears here is the energy minus e naught. And e naught is the ground state energy of each super multiple. Finally, this one over e, you can think of it as coming from the fermions, although it's not that straightforward, but, but okay, it is what it is, what comes from the calculation. <clears throat> so you have a BPS states of zero archers, and then you have a bunch of an infinite number of non BPS multiples of different minimal archers k. Um, most of them have a, a gap given by this formula, and only the, the multiple that has archers minus one half and plus one half, for which this vanishes, has a non, well, non vanishing gap, um, but it behaves a little different than the, than the other ones. Any question about this? I'm supposed to trust the four pi squared. Oh, uh, let me see. Yeah, I think I, I was careful about that. But the, the but actually the normalization is not very it's not very meaningful because you can shift it by you can remove it by a shift of S not. Okay. Yeah, here I I picked go here. If we have we've written two formulas mm -hmm. and it's only one S not. Yeah, 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 yeah. So with, with this eight by square, then the two are consistent by square would be nice when you put the hard thing as yeah, I would have sort of. Well, this choice correlates to another choice when I compute hard genes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah but I know that maybe Yeah, an important point uh, for what to mention this one over E. So, in principle, it looks just like an innocent modification of the bosonic <clears throat> formula. But something that this does is that. When you okay, let, let me say first that the disk density of states, this rho k of e, can be used to determine well in the other formula, it correlates to the choice of the matrix potential for the supercharge. So if you tell me what the disk density of states is, then you can determine the matrix potential of the matrix model. Um, something funny is that this formula, as written, well, if you analytically continue, of course, this is only for uh, between E naught for real values of E between E naught and zero, but if you define what's called the spectral curve, it has a pole at E equals zero. And that is something uh, slightly unfamiliar. And the, the explanation of that is that in the matrix potential, it requires a logarithmic term. And that's something we usually don't add, at least not in previous discussions of connection with JT gravity. We usually assume the matrix potential to be an analytic function of the eigenvalues. But to reproduce this pole, you need to have a, well, <coughs> you need either a logarithmic term on the potential or what's the same. You need this parameter of the measure to scale with e to the s naught, which is what we are finding because the number of BPS states scale with e to the s naught. Uh, okay, there are some differences with the cases with less supersymmetry. For example, in n equals one, the simplest theory of gravity has a has no BPS states, and if you want BPS states, you need to add so-called uh, Ramon punctures. Then you have number of BPS states of order one. But here, without any modification of the theory of gravity, it already comes with a this large number of BPS states. Okay, now I want to describe the two-boundary wormhole. So this will be the first non-trivial checks. What I did so far was just to determine the matrix potential. And here, what I'm, by the two-boundary wormhole, what I mean is the, the path integral on the uh, equal to JT gravity with two boundaries, the leading order in the genus expansion, and that corresponds to surfaces with the topology of a cylinder, which after integrating out the dilaton will, will be hyperbolic. <clears throat> Then, as usual in JT gravity, we will have. Uh, we can use the fact that that this 
metric is hyperbolic to, to divide it in two. So for any hyperbolic metric, there will be a, a geodesic in the middle of length B in the bosonic case. And then we can uh, separate the moduli of this surface by, well, first we have the reparameterization moduli on each boundary. And then we also have to integrate over the moduli of how we glue these, these surfaces with the ADS boundary and the geodesic boundary. In any plus two case, besides B, we also have a parameter we call phi, which is the, the U1 holonomy of the U1 gauge field around this geodesic. Is, uh, we label it by phi, so the holonomy is, is e to the I phi. And when we integrate <clears throat> over the intermediate circle to glue the two, the two well, what people call trumpets, uh, we will need to integrate over the length and over this U1 holonomy. And for now, there are no fermionic moduli internal to, to the geometry. So all the fermionic moduli are in the, in the reparameterization. This is different when we go to more complicated surface, there will be also not fermionic moduli. Anyways, let me, just to make the point I want to make, let me write down the answer for, for the trumpet in N equals to JT gravity. Uh, so we have a sum over k, where again k is integer plus delta. Uh, I won't go over the whole calculation, but I just wanted to make a couple of remarks on the final answer. Okay, so th this is the answer that depends on, on alpha. Well, first it depends on alpha and beta. These are the, the parameters of the asymptotic the ADS2 boundary. And it depends on, on the geodesic length B, and, and here phi is this one column. Uh, the first observation we can make is that there is no contribution from the VPS states. So if you see all the, the sum over K only involves the non VPS multiplets that, moreover, they have a a gap, they start at E naught, at least except for, for this special multiple I mentioned before. <clears throat> oh, and then a nice feature is that this, this part of the, of the formula that depends on the length and the temperature is exactly the same as bosonic JT gravity. Uh, so that makes, well, that, that's important for, for the match to work. Um, yeah, so then the, the final answer, if we take this, this trample will be to integrate over over the length and the colonomy. And the second point I want to, I want to make is that you can see that the boundary colonomy couples to A plus one half. So this is the average charge between the two multiplets. You can think of this K plus one half as a bulk R charge and then the plus or minus one half. So the, Super multiples which have charge k plus or minus one half, and this plus or minus one half is a contribution from the boundary fermions. Uh, but anyways, when when you plug this formula here, this will go as e to the i phi k one minus k two. Or let me call it. If this is left and right, then this is k left and k right. So the integral over the intermediate holonomy will identify the super multiple that appear appearing on both sides. Um, the implication of this is that the, um, we see from gravity that the super multiples are statistically independent. So this is the simplest check of, of the statements I made from the anometric form. You understand the reason why the VPS states do not. Sorry, what? You understand the reason why they don't contribute in this catastrophe? Oh, uh, besides doing the calculation and checking the. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. 
I mean, something you can understand a little better is if you try to compute the index, which would be a specific value of alpha. Um, and then you can understand why the index would vanish based on, because there are fermion zero modes in the bulk. Then you will have to get a non-zero answer for the index. But in principle, you will have BPS states with, with zero index. I mean, that would be, and naturally it would be like what I said before of having pairs of states that would not be, um, that could in principle combine into a non BPS multiple. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't happen. We see that instead there is just no no BPS states. I mean, technically they cancel or they just not there at all? Uh, no, no, they, they're not there at all because here I turn on arbitrary chemical potential. So I, if there was, states of zero energy at charge k and k plus one, they, they will contribute differently to the partition function. Yeah. If they were contributing here, you describe it by saying what's the number of weak states that around the environment. Yeah. So what we find is that it pays more like a C number. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I said it before, I mean, I should repeat it now. So the, yeah, the conclusion is that in our ensemble, we shouldn't take these variables to fluctuate. Yeah. Perhaps because they're integers, they couldn't fluctuate much. Uh, yeah, although we're taking like a large L limit, so you could say that very large, maybe an integer is a small correction to. Yeah, it's a infinitely minus set not. Yeah, I don't know how to incorporate the fluctuation of the VPS states in gravity. Yeah, maybe it's related to. Yeah. Um, well, something we discussed is, is. Well, you could make them fluctuate as you actually want by having a gas of Lamont punctures or other defects. So but that would give a gravity theory where the number does fluctuate. It will give, wait, wouldn't it give you a gravity theory with a different number of BPS states, but within that theory, they don't fluctuate, right? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Yeah, can, is there a way to connect this with anything in n equal four? So if I try to construct some object in n equal four that can go to that in this limit. To what, to what, to what? So you, you say you're computing an index, but with a particular ensemble. Ah. So is there an analog of that object? In yeah, no, because you see, to, to, to figure out that this independence of the super multiplets, you need to turn on a chemical potential that will distinguish different super multiplets. Different charges. Uh, so that's not going to be something that is protective, obviously. Um, so you need to go, yeah. We are trying to say something about non BPS state, so then you, you shouldn't be able to use something, uh, something that is protective, like, a, like an index. <clears throat> but yeah. Oh, well, well, all you can say is what we were saying right now that, that if you try to compute the index, then the index does not get contribution from wormholes and it's not something that fluctuates in gravity. That's, I think, the only thing I know I could say. Okay. Any other question? Um, okay, and let me just point out the last comment. So I, I emphasize that this temperature dependence is the same as bosonic JT. And the, the reason why this is important is that once we decided there are no fluctuations of BPS states and no uh, correlation between different super multiples, we can ask what is the connected two point function of, it, of uh, well, two point function, I mean this. So, um, the connected correlator between two partition functions within a single super multiplet. So the first thing I just said is that, okay, it will be non-zero only for K1 is equal to K2. Here K1 and K2 are the labels of the super multiplets. But moreover, the, the actual value of temperature dependence would be exactly the same. Supersonic JT, except for the shift of the ground state energy. And this function of beta one and beta two is precisely also the prediction of, of that ensemble because within each super multiple we have the usual <coughs> uh, topological expansion of a uh, Adrian C. Bauer matrix. Sorry, I maybe missed that. Yeah, I'm just looking at the contribution from a single super multiple. Oh, right. So I don't need to turn on. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at the statistics of the 
of the eigenvalues that appear in a single figure. Yeah. Okay, in the last 15 minutes or so, I will make some comments about the general case. The general case, I mean, we want to add more wormholes and consider surfaces of more complicated topology. Uh, for this, so this part is a little complicated, uh, but so let me try to summarize it and see as much as say as much as I can say this time. Uh, so let me first point out that if we look at closed surfaces, so this is easier, what I want to say is easier to state for closed surfaces. And we want to do the path integral of JT gravity on a closed surface. We first localize on hyperbolic metrics. Um, and then the final answer is an integral over the modular space of this hyperbolic matrix of a certain genus and zero boundary. And um, then here there is a there is a measure that I call tau for for given genus and no boundaries. And in, in the JT gravity path integral, this measure comes from the one loop determinants of um, um, around these hyperbolic surfaces. <clears throat> um, Mathematically, this would this have to be a measure over this modular space of hyperbolic surfaces. So we need to determine the measure or equivalently the one loop determinants. But a, <clears throat> a nice surface, a nice property that they satisfy is gluing. So for example, if we have a let's say a genus two surface like this, and we want to compute the, the JD gravity path integral over it, we can separate it. Like we did for the for the two boundary one fold in three <clears throat> geodesics using three, three geodesics. So let me call them S1, S2, and S3. We can separate it in two pairs of pants and call Y1 and Y2. Let's say. And then the measure of this surface will be the product of the measure of the two pairs of pants divided by the measure of the, by the one by the measure that comes from the circle. So the interpretation of this formula is that when you compute the measure on a, a three-hole sphere, it will get contribution from variations of the boundary parameters. But when we multiply the two of the two boundaries, we will be overcounting the fluctuations of the boundary values. And then we have to divide by the, the measure coming from the, the circles not to overcount these degrees of freedom. Um, so the upshot of, of <clears throat> But what I'm saying here is that one can compute the measure over an arbitrary uh, modular space for any, sorry, the measure of, for an arbitrary number of handles and, and boundaries uh, using the three hole sphere and the circles as building blocks. So the problem reduces to evaluating this measure uh, in this two simple, simple circle. Uh, so I'm not going to describe the, the, the circle. Let me just make some comments about the three-cold sphere. It's more interesting. So we can draw the three-cold sphere in this way. Um, so imagine there is a hyperbolic metric and it has three geodesic boundaries. Um, if, <clears throat> OK, maybe I didn't say it, but uh, Hyperbolic metric in the first order formulation corresponds to a flat connection of the SU1, comma one slash one supergroup. Uh, we can describe this connection by saying the colonomies around the three boundaries that are called U, V, and W. So these are three group colonomies of, of SU1, comma one slash one. Um, individually, each of these matrix, matrices can be diagonalized. Um, we can describe them by their Eigenvalues that specify the geodesic length, let's say B, or um, for you, I call it A and pi A, for B, I call it B and pi B, and for W, it's B and pi C. Uh, for each three cos sphere, we're going to assign the three geodesic length and the three one columns. Um, and moreover, the smoothness of the connection in the, in the interior of the surface tells you that u times b times w has to be one. <clears throat> okay, so then um, 
Okay, so here I mentioned that one can diagonalize them, but of course, in principle, they don't commute, so you cannot do this simultaneously. So the procedure to compute the one of the terminal consists on, well, first let's say we, we focus on U and V, so W is determined by, by smoothness, so we don't have to worry about it. And we pick some canonical form for, let's say, U not, and call them U not, V not. Um, Mm. Well, let me write one, for example. For example, we can pick you not. So this notation indicates that this this two this will be a two by two block that is the SL2R part of the matrix. This will be the U1, and the of the diagonal terms are the fermionic generators. So we can pick a canonical form that takes this. This expression. Uh, so we have this bosonic part of the matrix. A appears here. In the SL2 R block and describe the genesis length. That is an off diagonal parameter because, as I said, we cannot assume that they're all diagonal simultaneously. And this kappa will be related ultimately to, to the parameters of, of, of the third hole. Uh, phi R is the, the U1 holonomy. And then we have this, this other module like Psi1 and Psi2 that are um, multiplied by Q and Q2. These are generators that populate the of diagonal parts of the matrix, which are the fermionic generators. And then we can write a similar formula for, for V0 that will, will, will depend on the geodesic length on the uh, B, on 5B. Uh, we also have another pair of fermionic moduli. So in total, we have four internal fermionic moduli and, and the boundary parameters. Let me tell you roughly the, the result. I'm not going to go through all the steps, but the measure on this three-hole sphere, one can prove that it's given by by the following quantity. Oh, sorry, one thing I didn't say. So I picked this canonical form, but then we need to also consider other matrices that are related by conjugation. Where R is the element of SU1, one, one slash one. So then U not is a fixed matrix, but then R is arbitrary. And the one of the determinant is given by this formula. So this is the product of the volume forms of the of the group for the colonomy U and V. Um, and then we divide by the by the volume of R. And this is perhaps intuitive because uh, the action of R is, is part of the gauge symmetry, so we should uh, um, gauge it. <clears throat> And then U U and V just parameterize the 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 flat connections in the BF language or the hyperbolic matrix, uh, since the third boundary is fixed in terms of of U and V by smoothness. <coughs> so here the non trivial calculation is to 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 use these representations of the colonomies to plug it in this formula. Uh, there are some subtleties that I don't have time to go into, but this produces an answer. That roughly takes this form. Okay, I'm removing the external parameters and keeping only the internal ones. Uh, so this is a 
a naught is some function of 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 the length. And coronam is that comes from the calculation. K, I separated it because the well, the reason why I separated it, so I may just have to say it without writing the formula, but K naught will be a, a function that does not depend on the fermion moduli, and K will have will be nil potent. So it will be something proportional to fermion squared or fermion to the fourth. Um, the same about F. So <clears throat> when you look at the constraint on the three cold sphere by smoothness, the sum of the three U1 coronamics have to be zero for the U1 connection to be smooth. But again, if we turn on the fermionic module, I can have corrections that I call F here that depend on the fermionic module. Uh, and then it's important to keep them because, uh, for example, if if there would be no, and this is what happens in N equals one, if there, if there would be no fermionic moduli dependence on the on the on on the one of the terminal, then whenever you integrate over this internal moduli, you just get zero because it's a fermionic integral. Uh, but thanks to to the facts that appear in K and the facts that appear in psi, sorry, the fermionic moduli psi that appear in K and F, we get a non-zero answer for the Greek sphere. Um, and then we can use this to glue to construct more general, more complicated surfaces. In principle, you had an integral over six six sides, right? And then four by six. So I didn't write it down. Per, you had two pair of holes, right? Oh no, no, but that's pretty yeah. Good. Yeah, so that W is fixed by its movements. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's why in the formula it doesn't appear because we can only use U and V to parameterize. The connection. Um, yeah, so for example, just to give it another value, we can compute the path integral on this triple sphere <clears throat> by, so I mean, we can use this as a building block for more complicated surfaces, but we can also use it to compute the actual JT path integral on the triple sphere. Then we literally just take this formula and integrate over the fermions. Um, let me just write the value. Just to show you as an example of how this looks like. Uh, so the <clears throat> dependence with the geodesic, uh, with the U1 coronomics is very simple. It's through derivatives of acting on the delta function. And I'm showing you this formula because actually you can use this, these results to compute the path integral on more complicated surfaces with more, more handles and more boundaries. Um, it's always a, a feature that the answer will always be proportional to delta functions with a different number of derivatives. And then the coefficient will be different powers of, of the boundary lengths. Um, and then this is important because when you use the, 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 the yeah, when you use these trumpets to glue the ADS2 boundaries, uh, the integral over the geodesic lens will guarantee that to all orders in perturbation theory, the super multiples are statistically independent. Uh, is that clear? Um, well, just to emphasize, because um, so one one thing that was required required to 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 show that this theory of gravity is dual to this random matrix theory was to I already said it, but was to generalize what Mirza Kani did in the bosonic world to to this n equals two surfaces. Uh, that wasn't done in the math literature, but but we, we but when, once you have this path integral in the three cold sphere, and one one needs to do some um, geometry analysis to to reproduce her her derivation of the topological recursion. Well, we did that um, and got the same as the loop equations of this random matrix model. So of course, I'm not gonna uh, describe how that goes, but it's in the paper. Yeah, theory. Normally, if I remember correctly, you get on a Riemann surface, you get a single representation everywhere. Yeah. You also get that feature here. Yes. Yeah, so that's that feature comes from the fact that the dependence with the holonomics is so simple as just some of the functions with. Um, so here, the representation would be like one of these super interpreted as yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little more tricky because, but but it's roughly what you said. But what happens is that. 
five couples to this K plus one half that you can think of as the bulk charge. And then what happens is that you have the same bulk charge propagating everywhere. But when you translate this to the ADS2 boundaries, this bulk charge labels a super multiple that come with two boundary charges. Uh, because you can think of it as including the charges of the two boundary fermions. So that, that effect comes through the boundary. Then. Yeah, exactly. If you forget about the boundary, you could talk about fixed charges in the bulk and instead of super multiple. So fixed charge, or, or is it the fixed as you one comma one slash one representation? No, no, it's charge because I'm talking about the U1 colonomy. <clears throat> um, uh, so, Sorry, ah. I thought you were talking about everything. So I, I, my question was about everything. Oh, about everything. Uh, we didn't think about it that way. Uh, I mean, I guess you could interpret both B and phi together as labeling some representation of SU1, 1 slash 1. Uh, I think you're describing what one testing. Here, in this case, for the 3 l 2 the delta function means you have this. Some of all representations, but the same representation of each boundary. I think he's asking about the representation of the full okay, SU1, so one comma one slash one. We never had to think about it that way. But I don't know if you have anything to say about this. I think the statement, which is now what you're saying, is that the super multiples of the boundary theory are statistically independent. So you always get the same super multiple. Yeah. But there's no, there isn't a way of thinking about this calculation and saying that there is one representation that is wearing diagram. So normally, I think in BF theory, you can think of just one representation that is everywhere. In. But maybe I'm remembering correctly. No, no, you're, you're not. Maybe that's more clear for compact groups, though. Yeah, for compact groups, I think. It's uh, yeah, more straightforward. If you try to apply it to SL2R or SU1. Yeah, yeah, you might know what the answer is. Yes. So I, I mean, I think we try to we try to do it in a way that uh, things are well defined for non compact group. Maybe it's not true for SL2. So it would mean that. Uh, no, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, well, anyways, we, we try to use this, this approach of computing the one of the terminals using this. The, the technically, this is called the torsion. There is a way of comparing this at integrals. And yeah, in fact, the reason we use this approach is because it works for non compact groups and we don't have to guess uh, the formula based on an analogy with a compact case. So, yeah. Uh, Okay, it's yeah, already, already over time, but well, let me just make a couple of short comments. So first, the, the disk, well, maybe we already discussed a little bit, but the partition function of gravity on the disk determines the, the matrix potential and the number of VP states, meaning the component of solution of Q squared equals zero. And as Edward already mentioned, we can add gases of defects in the bulk, uh, which, uh, well, we started with Henry Maxwell and also Edward 2020. Uh, and when you add a gas of defects, you can modify the density of states on the disk. Um, that corresponds to modifications of, of this matrix potential. So you can create more, more um, a large variety, variety of random area ensemble that change the numeric potential. And if you add the analog of n equals to analog of the Ramon function corresponds to uh, supersymmetric defects where the deficit angle is related to the U1 phalonomy. Then you can create configurations that change the number of VP states and move you away different components of solutions of, of Q squared equals zero. Um, another generalization that I'm not going to discuss, but it's in the paper, is with time reversal. And in this case, there are two different theories depending on whether time reversal commutes or anti commutes with charge conjugation. And one has to again classify the ensembles and, and include the unorientable surfaces in the bulk. And then we find that they match with between gravity and random matrix ensembles. Uh, so let me stop here. Thank you.
No questions? Yeah, I think we have part of it. Okay. Let's just thank you again. Okay. Thank you.